if you're within a couple of hours of St. Joe, Missouri in early November, uh, get to Civic Arena because you're going to see some really, really good women's basketball. And with that, it's a new year for the A-Game Show. I'm Chris Rouch here with MIAA Commissioner Mike Racy. It's a new year, new opportunities for all these schools across the MIAA. Happy to be joined with you again. It's time for the fall sports season to get underway. I hope you had a good summer, and I'm sure it flew by pretty quickly, though. Too quick, too quick, always too quick. But, uh, Chris, I'm really excited about this upcoming year. I I think, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's good to start seeing student-athletes back on campus and Preseason practices are going on, and people are excited for first games. And uh, uh, I know our fans are ready uh, to tailgate and get to games and stadiums. So, um, it uh, yeah, it's that time of year, and it's always exciting uh, to get things started. You talk about the fall sports season, uh, practices underway, uh, student athletes back on campus. I know uh, for Missouri Western, the Chiefs are wrapping up this week here on campus, but that doesn't mean the other sports haven't already started. Um, what excites you the most when it, when a new season comes around? Because that football media day is kind of that unofficial kickoff. I think for a lot of people is that's in July. A couple of weeks later, it, it's back to work for not just football but the other fall sports as well. Well, I, I uh, it's a it's exciting. It's also a burden, and that's that's the expectations that go with being part of the MIAA. You know, we have. We have programs in women's soccer, uh, volleyball, football, uh, student athletes in cross country that, you know, their goal is a national championship. Um, And, you know, that makes it exciting to be part of this conference that um, every, every new year brings that hope and that opportunity, um, you know, on, on all of our campuses and, it's it's hard, you know. It's hard to to have expectations that high, year after year after year. Just ask, you know, some of our coaches. Um, you know, they uh, they that that's the pressure that they live with. Is you know, they're part of a great conference. They they uh, they know that it's uh, not just about winning a conference championship, but but uh, making the playoffs and making a deep run in the NCAA tournament and. Um, you know, I think that's what that's what makes me excited every summer, knowing that, you know, those opportunities are there uh, for our student athletes and coaches and and fans. Um, you know, there's some new things this year with with football, you know, some non-conference games, uh, you know, starting uh, in week zero when when some of the, the Division one games kick off. Uh, uh, Women's soccer and volleyball, uh, Chris, will be will be back at neutral championship sites for those uh, for those tournaments. Uh, volleyball back in St. Joe, uh, women's soccer uh, back in Wichita, um, and uh, you know having those events on on uh, you know neutral championship uh, 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 sites, fields uh, uh, that that uh, courts uh, that makes. Uh, you know, that makes it even more better, I think, as far as the student athlete experience in those sports. So we're, we're excited to get things going. And, uh, yeah, you know, uh, first, first football game uh, uh, is just uh, two weeks away. So it'll be here before we know it. We'll get more into football um, right before, you know, that those Thursday night kicks off. But I'll ask you a couple – just a real quick question on the way football is shaking up this year. And you guys touched on it back on Media Day in July. But this new – week zero in the non-conference that we haven't seen in 10 years, give or take a year or two there. But that opens up a lot, I think, that, you know, I think MIAA football fans know for the most part that it does do that, that it opens up, you know, outside of the conference play and helps with regional, you know, seeding down the road. But how important was week zero and these opportunities for the MIAA schools to prove themselves when it comes to trying to get into the playoffs? Well, you know, obviously the MIAA played a big role in in initiating this proposal and and having it considered by the the Division II membership. But you know, people think it only benefits the MIAA. We you know we had half the membership, more than half the membership, 
uh, voted in favor of it. And they, they see the benefit too. And I think, I think the two things that it really creates, Chris, is, is just greater flexibility. You know, we were trying to figure out um, the MIAA, the GLIAC, the, the, the Lone Star Conference, the Gulf South Conference, other conferences, trying, ha- trying to figure out how to play uh, 11 games in 11 weeks and, and find non-conference games. And, and it, it's, it's impossible. Um, and you have to have that 12th week to create that type of scheduling flexibility. You know, there are a lot of uh, folks or a few folks anyway saying, well, let's, you know, let's just add a week on the back end of the schedule. And that, you know, that sounds great. But then, you know, you've got to figure figure out how that works with your media partner and the national championship site, a lot of moving pieces. And if that happens someday, great. You know, we might be able to move back the start of, of our season. Um back to week one, but we need 12 weeks. And this, this provides that scheduling flexibility. And then I think the other benefit people don't spend enough time talking about is the, the off week it provides for our student athletes. Um, there's no other sport in division two that doesn't have an opportunity for coaches as they're, as they're building their schedule to, to create uh, some time in that schedule for student athletes to recover and to heal and to, you know, to, to spend some time just away from the sport, to, to, uh, to do things they need to do related to their, to their academics and their studies and other things. But um, now we have that in football. You know, we have 12 weeks to play 11 games, and um, I think it makes it a, a safer and more healthier environment for Division II football student-athletes. Like I said, we'll get more into uh, the start of the football season here in a couple of weeks here, as well as the other fall sports uh, you mentioned MIAA volleyball tournament coming back to St. Joseph again this year. That's not the only uh, Division II MIAA kind of uh, event coming to uh, St. Joseph. I know uh, the Sports Commission director up here, Brad Easley, has uh, been very busy, not just college but high school and everything in between. But the uh, Division II CC, CCA, try to say that fast, tip-off classic coming to Civic Arena in the early part of November 2nd and 3rd. And we talked about it, I think, on a podcast or two ago. Uh, two net, two days of a really good women's Division II college basketball at Civic Arena. Yeah, it's the it's the premier women's basketball event um, that will help tip off uh, the Division II college women's basketball season. We have four teams from the MIAA plane, and yeah, we spent time a couple of episodes ago when we announced the field. Uh, talking about just how tough it's going to be, we've got we've got the four MIAA schools that that finished uh, at or near the top of our rankings last year, and then we've got we've got four teams coming in, including two that were in the Elite Eight last year, and two others that were in the regional finals. Um, and and it's going to be you know it's going to be a, a great um, showcase of women's basketball, and um, you know we. You know, people ask me what, you know, we, we host it. The MIAA is the, the host and we're, we've done it in Kansas City. Now we're taking it up to St. Joe uh, for this year. And people ask, you know, why, why would the MIAA get involved in something like that? It costs money. It obviously takes a lot of work. Amber Feldman on our staff is, is um, you know, supervising that, that tournament. Um, and it is a lot of work and it does cost money, but it's worth it. Why? Because I think it gives our basketball programs an advantage. Our women's basketball coaches, our women's basketball student athletes deserve to play in these type of events. They deserve to play in them close to home where it's not a huge expense uh, for them to go on the road and do it. And maybe the most important thing, it gives them two more games exempt events that don't have to count against the maximum number against some of the best competition in division two. Um, you know, we do that. We, we wanted to sponsor this. We do this tournament because we believe it gives our women's basketball teams an advantage. And, um, you know, those are the types of things a conference office can do to help position our teams for postseason success. If you look at it, November 2nd and 3rd, I'll look at the schedule real quick. Um, on that Saturday, November 2nd, Central Missouri, Southern Nazarene, Pittsburgh State, Ferris State, Northwest Missouri, and Ashland, Missouri Southern versus Texas Women's. 
Then on day number two, it's Pittsburgh State versus Southern Nazarene, Central Missouri versus Ferris State, Missouri Southern versus Ashland, and then Northwest versus Texas Women's. And I think some local basketball fans were, saw these teams like you talked about. They were making runs to the uh, well to St. Joe here through the Elite yep. Eight and everything. So some of these teams, not the MIAA, some local basketball fans got to see back in March. And I think that also maybe helps keep the local interest of non, maybe not non-traditional following of MIAA basketball, but they've seen the high level competition that comes with MIAA division two women's basketball. Cause they were here in March watching some of these teams compete at the same level too. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's no, uh, there's no sport in intercollegiate athletics, probably um, more popular now um, because of Caitlin Clark um, than women's basketball. And, and I think a lot of, a lot of fans were introduced to Division Two basketball last season because of, uh, you know, folks uh, watching Caitlin Clark and seeing how great the women's basketball game is at the collegiate level. And and um, you know, so it's it's great that we can showcase these awesome teams in St. Joe in a in an arena that's been the stage for Division Two national championships. And uh, yeah, I think if uh, if you're, you know, if you're within a couple of hours of St. Joe, Missouri in early November, uh, get to Civic Arena because you're going to see some really, really good women's basketball. Coming up in just a few months, I will be here before we know it as well, because as you and I both know, uh, the calendar doesn't stop and it seems like it flies by pretty quickly. But yeah. uh, we got to get to uh, something before November. And I mean, this will carry over into November, but uh, a new opportunity for the uh, the league and uh, 38th spot down in Kansas City, a TV station, um, partnering up for a football game of the week. And uh, you know, reading the release you guys sent out, this seems like it's an opportunity – Again, kind of like in the way that the showcase is, maybe not traditional MIAA football, basketball fans can now a chance to take in some MIAA football in this matter and maybe grow the game that way as well. Yeah, it's one of those things, again, Chris, where we've put some additional duties and work on the conference office, but it's worth it because I think, again, it gives our football programs an advantage. There's really no other conference in Division Two. Uh, that has, uh, you know, this type of a, of a television opportunity, a game of the week, um, showcasing, um, you know, its, its stadiums, its facilities. Um, it's, you know, for each of our homes, home teams, it, it's going to really turn into a three-hour public service announcement about that institution, you know, uh, highlighting uh, different degrees and departments and interviews with the president, the athletic director at halftime. And so it's a great, it's a great opportunity for us to showcase our schools. Um, and, and that's why we do it, you know, and it, it's, it's a, it's a pretty big lift. It's um, something that uh, the MIAA used to have a, a TV game of the week before we started our network. And then, you know, obviously we've been exclusively broadcasting all of our events uh, some 1500, live sporting events every year on the MIAA network. But we wanted we wanted to do this um, as as not uh, something to detract or take away from our network, but maybe a value add. Um, you know, we believe that we're going to reach uh, some some fans, some college football fans in the greater Kansas City area with this game of the week that that may not have uh, have known about MIAA football. And, and may be so impressed that they want to, you know, they want to start watching more games on the network, maybe, maybe enjoy it so much they want to buy an annual subscription and watch all of our sports. So, you know, we're hoping we attract a lot of new fans, a lot of new viewers uh, to our network through this. And, um, you know, the big thing for football, Chris, I posted this the other day. I got an email uh, from a former MIAA football student athlete um, thanking me for bringing the the TV game of the week back. And he said that when he was, uh, he remembers when we did this before and it was his opportunity through watching those games of the week as a, uh, you know, someone before high school and in high school to discover the MIAA. And by watching those games, he realized how high level MIAA football is. And he made his mind up watching those games that he wanted to play MIAA football. 
And, you know, so I'm hopeful that this, uh, in a, you know, a pretty big market where a lot of our schools recruit, I'm hoping that we have a lot of, a lot of young people that watch uh, these MIAA football games and, and, uh, you know, certainly consider uh, playing at an MIAA school when it comes time for them to decide where to go to college. And this will be on 38th the spot down in Kansas City, uh, MIAA Game of the Week. It starts off August 31st, 7 o'clock, with a battle of two of the top six teams in the NCAA Division II preseason rankings, Ferris State at Pittsburgh State. So it doesn't get much bigger as a uh, Game of the Week than having two top six, pro- two of the top six programs in the country facing off on yeah. uh, TV. We we couldn't pick a better game, and and uh, fans in the Kansas City area we treated to a great one, and you know, thirty eight to spot. They're really becoming, um, you know, kind of a a sports uh, a sports mm-hmm. hub. Um, they've got the agreement with the uh, professional women's soccer team in Kansas City, the KC Current. They they've been broadcasting Chiefs Kansas City Chiefs preseason games. Uh, they're the home of. Uh, um, they're the home of uh, Kansas City Mon- Monarchs minor league baseball team, um, and now they're adding, you know, the MIAA game of the week. So um, a lot of a lot of sports fans tune in to 38th spot, and I'm confident that uh, those sports fans will enjoy watching uh, uh, MIAA football, especially that first game uh, that we're dishing out for them, the Fair State Pittsburgh State game. Okay, and that will be August 31st at seven o'clock kickoff there. Ferris State at Pittsburgh State. That is in just two weeks away here to open up the season. But we still have more to talk about here on on the show today. And as always, we always kind of get back to the uh, state of the NCAA. Yeah. (laughs) That has been evolving since we started uh, talking monthly, biweekly for the last four years or so. Um, NCAA getting a settlement with the House litigation. Um, What does that look like for Division II and the MIAA right now? Well, the and the settlement is, you know, um, the the plaintiffs and the defendants have agreed to it. We still, we still need a judge uh, uh, and the court to to sign off on on the settlement. I'm I'm hoping that that happens. There there have been a few uh, parties that have objected uh, to the settlement, but uh, all that'll be sorted out uh, by the judge. But you know the the settlement, Chris, is not only a you know a settlement of a class action. Um, antitrust lawsuit against the NCAA, um, you know, around, around issues of name image likeness before those, those rules went into place. And, um, you know, and I, and it's, you know, uh, we're talking billions of dollars. And if it goes to court and the NCAA loses, we're talking about more billions of dollars. So it's, it's, it's probably a good thing that, that we're close to uh, the settlement being finalized, but, more than the settlement and and how this uh, you know impacts that particular class, it really does create a framework, Chris, for um, a, a brand new model for Division One athletics. And you know, I'm going to be frank. It to me, it's a business model. Um, it's a it's a new model for college sports that that has a, a salary cap and you know uh, payments. Uh, uh, two student athletes as as part of that salary cap uh, elimination of scholarship limits and moving to more of uh, roster sizes and um, but uh, you know a twenty two million dollar annual salary cap uh, at uh, at Division one institutions that's uh, you know permissive legislation you don't have to spend that much but if you're going to be competitive. You're going to be spending a lot more money, and I, you know, I. Uh, that's the thing that, um, you know, I think that that interests us in the Division Two space and in the MIAA is, is how does this impact Division One, and what does that mean for membership, moving forward? I, you know, I can't say too many things with confidence other than this type of settlement will change Division One. It, it will, it will change. Division One membership. It it creates a business model uh, for schools who want to be part of that. And if you're if you're going to pursue intercollegiate athletics uh, under more of an educational framework with with uh, you know an educational mission, graduation, academics, uh, 
as as part of what that looks like. I, I think that there are going to be some schools in Division One that that may not be able to afford, may not be able to sustain operating in a business model and and need to consider how they become part of a conference like the MIAA. And, uh, you know, that that's what we're monitoring. That's what we're watching. That's what we're trying to figure out as I work with our presidents to, to, to really, um, you know, in the next year, see what this does, how it changes Division One, how it's implemented, and what impact that might have on their membership. And when you talk about that part, I mean, we know the Big Ten, the SEC, the Big 12, they're fine. I mean, they're, they're going to figure this out because they, they are the – whatever Division One's going to look like, whatever they go with in the future. That's probably, for the most part, what Division One could potentially be moving for, at least on the football side of things. Does that complicate potentially things for schools that are competitive in other sports? But since football is such a – Money, I mean, let's face it, it's a money maker. It's driven for these bigger schools in the SEC. Does that make it more complicated for those mid majors FCS schools where, well, we're still pretty competitive in these sports division one, but we can't go and spend the money that the other schools are? Yeah, and, that, and that's, I think, what complicates all of this and what will be interesting to see how it plays out over the, you know, over the next 12 months because, you know, the, the, the new provisions, the the you know the salary cap that I talked about is is scheduled to go into effect through the settlement in the fall of 2025. So, you know, Division One has a year to figure this out. And and your point, Chris, that you know this this settlement um, in kind of building this new business model for Division One athletics is more than just football. It, it's uh, you know it's changing the changing the rules and changing the game for all sports. So, you know, if you want to be good in Division One baseball, if you want to be good in Division One track and field, if you want to be good in Division One softball or volleyball, you know, there's going to be a new, uh, a new framework around what um, it looks like to be successful in that sport. And it's going to have high roster limitations. It's going to, you know, not have scholarship rules per se, that you're following and it's going to, you know, it's going to fall under this, uh, this uh, formula of a, of a salary cap and how that impacts uh, each of the division one sports. So it, it, that, that's the key part of, of this settlement. I think that, um, you know, is uh, the great unknown is it's not just football, it's all division one sports. And, you know, how does that impact division one and their championships and, and membership and and conference alignments and you know so a lot to figure out here in the next 12 months and you know like i said i'm i'm confident that there's going to be this there's going to be some spillover of all of this into um what we're doing in division two and what what division two looks like a lot of unknowns in the future for NCAA and Division One, Division Two, II, Division Three. All of it could look a lot different here in, like you said, 12 months to the next five, three to five years too. So we'll have to keep an eye on all that. All right, a little bit different now. We're going to switch gears, and this time we're going to have a special guest on the show with uh, Commissioner Mike Gracie and I. It's uh, one of the uh, new uh, employees down at the uh, conference office, Taylor Sabold. Taylor, a former uh, student athlete over at Fort Hay State. Is that correct? Yep, correct. Congratulations, and thank you for coming on with us. Uh, before we get into uh, your new job, uh, but it's basically student-athlete-focused, uh, just go into a little bit of uh, your background as a college student-athlete in, in the MIAA. Yeah, so I had an awesome experience at Fort Hayes. I spent the last five years there. I did track and field all five years. I was a freshman when COVID hit, so that kind of switched things up, but it honestly worked out great for me because I got like a full year back of eligibility. So it kind of allowed me to graduate in three and a half years with a marketing degree. And then I ended up getting my master's in my MBA in tourism and hospitality. So then I did that with my extra year and a half, my extra year of eligibility. So it worked out great. I I loved track. I loved my team and the school and being able to represent Fort Hayes. So it really was a win-win for me. And it was sad to leave after five years. Chris, I'll, I'll say that, you know, um, we're so impressed with Taylor. She, 
um, you know, in a pretty competitive uh, group of folks that we interviewed for this position, she stood out. And Chris, as we were just talking about, you know, kind of things that are changing in intercollegiate athletics, one of the things that we've recognized in the MIAA is that, uh, you know, we need to amplify the voice of our student athletes. We need, we need to hear what they think about their experience. We need to, to better connect with prospective student athletes and understand what they want from their experience at schools that are part of the MIAA. And, and that's why it was important for us to create this job and then go find someone like Taylor that had, uh, you know, competed in the MIAA at the highest level and all American, um, you know, obviously very bright, uh, great student, um, but someone that was recently uh, having that experience that can come in now and work with our schools and our current student athletes and prospective student athletes thinking about the MIAA. Wow, you, Taylor, you may make sure you get a recording of this to make sure you get all the things <laughs> you think you just said to rattle off. I and know. He says, what are you doing wrong? He's like, no, 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 no. He's Remember this nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, you guys are kind of talking about uh, looking forward to this um, opportunity position. I think, um, at least from my perspective, it seems very kind of an open-ended position of it. it could be a lot of different things. I think the league may want to do with a student athlete focused position. Uh, Commissioner Racy, I'll start with you. Um, what do you envision that this role looks like from, from a conference office level? Because there are so many uh, schools in the conference and it could go a variety of ways. Well, I, as I described to, to Taylor and other candidates that we're interviewing for this, we're, you know, we really wanted to build a, a position that was a liaison uh, to our student athletes uh, and our institutions and and really became the ambassador for the MIAA student athlete experience. It could go out there and talk um, to former student athletes or current student athletes or coaches and really, um, you know, have that message and that that uh, those talking points about really what's unique about competing in the MIAA, what's special about competing in the MIAA. So, you know, we have 5,000 student athletes on our campuses right now and we have five people in the conference office and um i think all of us in the conference office we've always done a good job of 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 keeping the student athlete in focus um but we all have different duties and responsibilities you know i'm i'm working uh, on things and projects that i have to keep our presidents and ad's updated on amber's running the office the operations the business side uh, Brent is focused on communication, working with our SADs. So, you know, Taylor now in this position, this new role, uh, she walks in the office every day focused on our student athletes. Um, and she brings that to every meeting in our office. She brings it to every meeting with our membership, you know, to, to help be that, that liaison, that, that voice, that, that, that person that understands what our students are doing, what they need. Um, so, th you know, those are expectations. It's a, um, you know, as you said, a brand new job. Um, you know, Taylor's kind of building this uh, as she works and uh, she's been with us for all of about 10 days. So, uh, <laughs> you know, um, uh, but, uh, you know, it's exciting. I think a young person like Taylor to have this type of responsibility and to come into a conference office setting um, with these as the objectives, I think it, it's a very, very exciting position that's really unlike anything else that is happening in, in Division Two athletics. So Taylor, 10 days in, you have everything figured out that you want to do, right? Uh, yeah, not quite. Okay. <laughs> um, what, is, what, what are some of your uh, goals, at least right now, that you want to see? Or what, what is something that you're focused on? I know it's really early, so this could change easily yeah. in six months. But what is something that you're passionate or very uh, focused on right now? No, for sure. So. One of the first things Mike talked to me about when I started my position was getting in touch with all of the advisors um, at each campus for the MIAA schools that are in charge of SAC, Student Athlete Advisory Committees. So I've been able to get in touch with all of them and I'm actually planning like one on one meetings over the next the course of the next month, probably um, just to hear about what SAC meetings look like for them, what events they have planned throughout the year. like how much engagement they're getting with their student athletes, because those are things that are important. We just wanna make sure that our student athletes are able to 
voice their opinions and what they want and what they see on their end of it and how we can relay that to other MIAA schools, administrators, athletic department, and just make sure that we are creating an environment where these student athletes are able to grow. So that's kind of what I've been working on right now. I actually have my first meeting today, so I'm excited to to meet with her. But I'm just here to do that, but also just to help with anything that I can in the, in the office. So it's just been little tasks, little social media things that I've been able to help with. And I'm really just happy to help with whatever because I'm learning and everyone's been so good about that, teaching me new things. So, so far, it's been great. I'm excited. Taylor, what what – what about your experience at Hayes? I mean, obviously something kept you there for five years, so it, it must have been a pretty darn good experience. But what what was it about being at Hayes and being part of the MIAA that was so special? And now that you look back on that, that you know you you can see how that's prepared you to be successful in this position at the conference office. Yeah. Um, so. Even coming into college, I didn't know a whole lot about the MIAA. I'd heard about some of the schools in the conference, but as I went through my first year, I was able to see how important athletics were, but also academics. Athletics are extremely competitive. Um, We all know that. So it definitely has taught me hard work to another level, but just being at Fort Hayes, it's taught me how to work together as a team, whether that be in the classroom or with my teammates, organization, I mean, time management. I really enjoyed the business school that I was part of at Fort Hayes. I felt comfortable and confident with the professors and the advisors that I had. They were there to help me um, with whatever I needed, and they were genuinely interested in knowing how I was doing with academics and with um, my athletics. So it was important to me to have that connection with those people in my life because they're people that I see every day and that um, I come in contact with. So that was great, but I was also able to see just how much the MIAA cares about their student athletes. I mean, there's so many resources for us that are made available. We had career fairs, we had mock interviews, um, different classes that we could go to just to continue to learn more. I mean, I think if you want to learn and grow, the MIAA is the place to be. Um, Fort Hayes showed me and athletics showed me that if I have a bad day or a bad week, like I can't, I can't take that to other parts of my life. I can't show up to my graduate teaching position and not do what I'm supposed to that day. I can't let my team, my team members down in a team project. Like I have to show up to those meetings maybe after a long day of practice. So Fort Hayes helped me in more ways than I can even like fathom and thank them for just because it was a great experience. And Fort Hayes is I don't know. They're kind of Southwest Kansas. They don't get a whole lot of credit, but there's not maybe a whole lot to do. There's not a whole lot of big towns around it, but I loved it. And I had the best time with my teammates. And I think as a student athlete, you're busy all the time. So if you're able to make friends with some friends there on campus that maybe aren't athletes, but for me, most of my friends were my teammates just because we were going through the same thing and we were going through it all together. And it was, it was great. Chris, as you can tell, Taylor had a pretty balanced experience as a student athlete um, at Hayes with a social life and doing things in the community and, you know, being uh, a top student. But, um, you know, she doesn't brag a lot, but I'll I'll brag. I mean, she was an All-American hurdler. And, you know, you know how you know how tough that is. I can't run 400 meters. You know, Taylor's running 400 400 meters and and uh, jumping over hurdles. And, um, um, you know, we're very proud as a, as a conference that, you know, she's a, an all American student athlete while at, while at Hayes and, and having that balanced experience. And now, now she's part of our team and she's, uh, you know, her mission is to try and help other student athletes in, in, uh, uh, in the MIAA have those same type of experiences. Taylor, last question I have for you, uh, then we'll get you out of here. Um, you know, you talked about student athletes' voices. Uh, Commissioner Racy talked about that a lot over the last four years, especially since COVID-19 and the task force that was created from there. Why is it important for presidents, athletic directors, the league to hear uh, from the student athletes? So the, the eight, I know it's people will say, oh, they're 18 to 23, 24-year-olds. What are they going to know about what all this has to be done? But there is a part that has to go into hearing from you guys right i mean that's a big part of it as well yeah for sure 
<clears throat> so I think athletes have kind of always been important and their voices have always been important. But with this job, I think it's really unique because we're putting student athletes and what they have to say at the forefront of what we're doing right now. And I have the opportunity to really be in that fully and immersed in that experience. And I'm so excited about that. I think as a recent graduate, I'm able to resonate with these student athletes a lot. Um, times have changed for sure. And even five years from now, I'm probably gonna be learning new things, how things are from student athletes that are coming in and that are graduating. So I think when you're in college, it can be overwhelming at times. There's a lot of things that you're doing at the same time as you're trying to manage that. So making sure that they feel confident to voice that, whether that's to me or their SAC advisor or going to their athletic department and making sure that they have a place to say, hey, I think we could do this better. I think this can make our my team in particular run better. I think this could be a great opportunity. Those are just all things that we want our student athletes to make sure they have the opportunity to do because the MIAA is always growing. We're always trying to look for the new best thing in order to grow and create the best environment and schools for our, our student athletes. So in order to do that, to do that, we have to listen to them and what they want and try to implement that. Because if one person is thinking that and feeling that way, then there's bound to be others that are definitely feeling that way also. Taylor, I know you got a busy schedule ahead of you, especially when you need to learn 5,000 uh, student athletes' names here in the next <laughs> month or so. So I know that's going to be a very big <laughs> Well, cat. there's five of us in here, so I only have to learn 1,000. <laughs> well, good, good. I was going to say, make sure everybody else learns some names as well as you go. And, uh, next time we have you on, uh, just take one of uh, Mike's helmets off the display behind him and put it on your back. I know. Yeah, just I need it. Yeah, that's of thinking, exactly what I was thinking. I need to vamp up my office a little bit more. <laughs> start slowly taking something every week and see if you notice it. And be like, where did this uh, go? Yeah, you know what? I might do that. <laughs> Thirty years of stuff up here. So Taylor, yeah, please, whatever, whatever you want to move over to your office would be fine with me. Okay. So. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll refrain from taking the family pictures. But if other things right. go missing, then don't you know where they're at. One to take, though, you should take the family photos first, and then be like, <laughs> he notices that that's not. There's family behind like, her. That looks familiar. <laughs> That's my family. <laughs> yeah. Taylor, appreciate the time today. And Commissioner Mike Gracie, it's good to catch up with you as well. A new season of the MIAA A Game Show. And we have a lot to get to throughout the rest of the year. But thank you guys again for the time this week. And uh, we look forward to the next episode as well. You bet. Good to yeah. see you, Chris. Thank, thank you so thank much. You. Good to meet you.